So, hi, I'm just going to introduce everyone on stage. So you'll find to my left, this is Olivia, she's a divestment campaigner in Sweden. Um, to my right there's Nega from Fossil Free Münster. There's Charlie from Fossil Free UCL in the UK. And there is Vatan from Fossil Free Amsterdam from the Netherlands. Fossil Free ABP, okay, yeah. And then there's Bill McKibben, co-founder of the organization 350.org. And my name, yeah, you can speak And my name is Tina, I'm a investment campaigner in Germany. And um, yeah, I would like to know what you all know and have heard about the divestment campaign. So, if you guys think uh, that you've already understood the divestment strategy, please stand up. Okay, that's like half of them. These guys don't know anything. <laughs> and, um, yeah, you can sit down again. If you think that the tactic of divestment is actually about money and withdrawing it from the fossil fuel industry, please stand up. You all know so much already. <laughs> so that we're just a few. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, I'm all in red. I also chose the red chair. So I'm basically a red line. And I want to know who of you is going to take part in D12 tomorrow? Get up, stand up. Yay! Give a hand to yourself. <laughs> That's amazing. Amazing. Thank you very much. Now I'm going to hand over to you, Bill, to tell us a little bit about the history of the fossil fuel divestment movement. All right. Thank you very much, you two. And if it's all right with you, I'm just going to stay seated down. I am worn out. Um, I can't remember the time before this cop began and what my previous life was like. And I've managed to come down with a cold or something. And um, um, But boy, is it good to be here. Um, I spent the last couple of days at Le Bourget, and it is, it is bleak and cold. And uh, you're, If you're not there, you're missing literally nothing. Um, <laughs> Although there is an excellent sandwich thing in fall three, I must say. But um, um, here's where the work's been done, and here's where the work's been done in places like this for the last five years. Some of you were probably at Copenhagen. The difference between Copenhagen and now is enormous. It's not that we're going to get an amazing treaty out of here. But we're, something's going to happen, and there's huge movement underway around the world. And the reason that things are starting to shift, the reason that we're beginning to block pipelines and coal mines, the reason that we're starting to divest, is because what we didn't have going into Copenhagen was a big mass movement around the world. And now all of you have built it. And as we put more and more pressure on these systems, that's when things begin to change. Not fast enough, okay? We've got to build it bigger and push harder. But we're now beginning to reach the point where we have to represent some kind of actual threat to the hegemony of the fossil fuel uh, uh, system. And that's a, um, that's a beautiful place to be, so thank you all. The divestment thing has been one big part of it. It sort of started three years ago now, I guess, or three and a half almost, uh, really about three years ago. Um, and it has spread so much faster than we thought it ever would. I remember just a little two and a half or so years ago when we had the very first college to divest, the very first institution of any kind. It was a tiny college in the US state of Maine with an endowment of $10 million, I think, and we were so happy when it divested, um, um, when it did the right thing, and very eagerly. And, and then things started to snowball, and by September of last year, uh, when the Rockefeller family, 
the first family of fossil fuel, the heir to the original oil fortune, when they said it's not morally proper nor financially wise to be invested in coal and gas and oil, when they divested, uh, that took us to $50 billion worth of endowments and portfolios, but it was a kind of psychological breaking point. Suddenly lots of people were saying to themselves, well, if the Rockefellers don't want to be invested in fossil fuel, why do I, you know? Um, and, and so in the 12 months after that, we went from $50 billion to three point some trillion dollars. Uh, um, now, not all of it's fully divested, and some people are just doing coal, and it's, there's tons of work to be done, and it's not, but it nonetheless has been remarkable for two reasons. One, it really has taken a lot of money out of things. Now, when we started, we didn't think that was going to be part of this, but by this point, it's making it difficult for people, especially coal companies, to raise capital, and that's powerful to see. The second reason, even more important, is that in those three years, you guys have driven into the absolute heart of the conventional wisdom this idea that we have to leave most fossil fuel in the ground. That's, that's what the divestment movement above all has been a vehicle for. When we started three years ago, I wrote an article for Rolling Stone that, you know, if you save your back issues, the one with Justin Bieber on the cover, okay? and, and, and it, it was one of the first times that people had laid out this math that we have to leave most of this stuff underground. Well, in three years, because of your work, not mine, because of your work, it went from the cover of Rolling Stone, and now everybody thinks it. Now the head of the World Bank says it, and the IMF, and Deutsche Bank, and uh, the governor of the Bank of England speaking to Lloyds of London Insurance, which is pretty much the definition of establishment, you know, if you think about it. They're like, yeah, you guys have way too much exposure to unburnable carbon that's going to become stranded assets. These things have become um, um, something that that everybody who knows anything about this stuff now kind of understands and knows, and it's beginning to reshape the debate. So you've done an unbelievable job of making it happen. And now we just try and keep this momentum going, and we try and merge it with all the other things that people are doing all over the place in this fight for climate justice. Merge it with the work that we're all doing to stop particular fossil fuel projects, you know? Um, 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 all the pipelines and coal mines and things that remind us very explicitly why we need divestment. And then there are these enormous new possibilities opening up for how to take this stuff to these fossil fuel companies hard. I think we're going to spend a lot of time in the year to come talking about ExxonMobil, the biggest fossil fuel industry on earth, which turns out also to be the biggest liars in the history of the planet. Um, um, guys who knew everything that there was to know about climate change 30 years ago and just flat out built this big architecture of deception and denial. We all together are going to make sure that nobody wants to be associated. We've got to turn them into the pariahs of our economy and our society. And in the process, we will continue to weaken this industry so we can actually get somewhere. Because and here's the tough part of all of this. We're not getting where we need to get as fast as we need to get there. This one has a time limit. So the speed with which we move is the most important thing. And we're not, I mean, in the last 10 days while we've been here in Paris, we've had epic floods that killed hundreds of people in Chennai. We had some of the biggest rainstorms in the history of the United Kingdom. We had 200 year record flood in Norway. We've had, uh, 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 in the Maldives, the highest rainfall ever recorded. Uh, the city of Portland, Oregon, had the single rainiest day in its entire history. 13 counties there are a disaster area today. This is what a world looks like that's gotten warmer. Warm air holds more water vapor than coal. We're way behind, so accelerating is the absolute essence of the game now, making it go faster. And divestment continues to be a remarkable tool for that, because even when we don't win, it's the 
tool for education, just repeating over and over and over again what we now understand about this industry and their hold on things. It's so powerful. So I just want to stop there and say incredible thanks to you guys for making this happen in so many places and to all of you. And, um, um, you know, um, we will look forward to seeing everybody out there tomorrow. Uh, uh, very chill and very um, 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 together and, and very much in solidarity with each other. Um, it's going to be one more of these occasions that we kind of keep this movement building, growing, attracting other people all the time because the goal of movements is always to attract more people, to reach further out into the center, to get more people engaged. And divestment has been such a tool for doing that. So thank you all so, so much. that the divestment movement is really spreading and it's also really spreading here in France. And we're really happy because that's just the latest developments. And uh, it's been just on for like half a year that our new colleagues started in France. And right now we already have 20 French city parliaments who are endorsing divestment. And that's just great news. And I want to thank all the French people who have worked with that. So please do that. from other places in Europe. We want to hear your recent wins and about your recent stories and what is really moving you. So, um, yeah, I want to ask you that. And you are targeting, you are targeting one of the biggest pension funds in the world with huge amounts of money. So what have been your latest successes and what are you proud of? Okay, um, yeah, so the ADP pension fund is the pension fund that we are targeting in the Netherlands, um, the fifth largest pension fund in the world, and they have a total amount of assets worth 350 billion euros. It's huge. And um, so we, we've been doing some research about how much of the amount of money they have invested in fossil fuel, in the fossil fuel industry, um, and it's 10% of that money is invested in the fossil fuel energy industry. That's 35 billion, million, uh, 35 billion uh, euros, which is insane. So um, we've targeted them since last year, April 2014, and uh, it resonates very much with me when you say that there's a shift occurring now, because within, from, from April 2014 until now, we have, we have had considerable success with this campaign. Just um, one month and a half ago, uh, they decided that they will, by 2020, decrease the CO2 emissions of their entire investment portfolio by 25%. And it's not divestment, we're still working towards divestment, and they will eventually divest. Um, they don't know yet. Um, but, um, yeah, because of the scale of things, this is huge. And when ABP moves, other pension funds move as well. And they know this. So, they know that they are going to divest, I believe so, uh, but they're doing everything they can to, uh, to avoid the word divestment. So what you have now in their new um, sustainability policy is they're not talking about plans to divest, but they're talking about plans to, within five years, no, they're talking about um, inclusion by, no, exclusion by means of inclusion. So it's really... <laughs> So the plan concretely uh, consists of the fact that they will bring their 5,000 holdings in different companies down to 3,500 holdings. Uh, coupled that with their ambition to lower the CO2 emissions um, by 20 25% in five year time. Because of the scale of things, there is no other option than to start divesting immediately. And um, we've been picking up signals that, you know, next year we might throw a party somewhere because of the first uh, divestment news coming in, but you never know, but this is what we're aiming for, and um, they won't try to make a sound about it, but we will, so it's going to be cool. <laughs> um, 
and that and one of your colleagues told me that you're a really tiny group of people. So you're um, about to make real change. How many are you? Right, so so you might think, right, uh, ABP and pension fund, they have these, um, you have to have a big campaigning group of very, um, very intelligent people to tackle them. <laughs> But we're not all that intelligent, we're just normal people. And it was four of us, five of us, six of us. Four of us, five of us, six of us. And that's all it took, you know. It took organization, it took mobilization, it took uh, a big heart, and it took some, um, some um, nights pulling through. But uh, does it really matter? No. You know, so if you just have your, um, your gut in the right place and you have a good connection with your gut, you know, go for the gut feeling, what is right, so just do it, you know. One last question. So, uh, you told me that their argument for not divesting is really engagement. Right. So, what have you been asking them? <laughs> right, so, this is funny. So. Um, we had a first conversation last year in September 2014. And when we had this conversation with them, 18th floor, Amsterdam, you know, big skyscraper, um, uh, we asked them a question, what did this active engagement do for the climate? Give me, we said, three examples, not four, not five, not six, just three examples of how active engagement did something good for the climate in the past 30 years. Silence. There was no, not a single example that they could give. So just recently, there's been a documentary uh, that you can all uh, look and see for yourself, which focuses on uh, fossil, free, uh, fossil free Berlin, but also ABP fossil free. And um, there's also a shot of the conversation we had with ABP just recently. Uh, but one of the things that I asked them then again was also give me three examples of how active engagement did something for the climate and for all of us. And again, they weren't able to give us very convincing examples. They only got to two, of which one was getting Shell out of the Arctic, which uh, Shell, of course, uh, denies. So, uh, yeah. And they've told us directly, very directly, if I may just add this. They've said, and it's been on the record, it's been taped, so we're not you know, making this up. But AP has told us that what we have done has, has accelerated their process of, of rethinking their investments in, in this industry. Big time, and and so yeah, we can do something if we just want to and go for it. Can I just say, active engagement, active engagement did get shell out of the Arctic, but it wasn't pension funds. It was three four thousand people in kayaks. <laughs> out in Thank you, Martin. Okay, um, let's go over to the UK. Charlie, I've heard you've been doing some real mischief over there. What are you doing? <laughs> yeah, so um, we've actually, Fossil Free UCL and the 15 of us, 20 of us who are here have come directly from um, occupying um, a big space at our university. <laughs> We cleared out last night and left a little message saying au revoir fossil fuels, see you again soon, and um, left it nice and tidy and here we are, overnight coach. Um, I guess I'll give a little bit of background maybe to the divestment campaign in the context of UK universities, um, because it's a story of like real wins, especially over the last couple of months. Um, from Glasgow last year, um, now this year we've had um, Warwick, we've had the School of um, Oriental and African Studies, we've had Surrey, we've had University of the Arts, we've had Oxford, we've had Edinburgh, um, and more. Sheffield! And Sheffield! <laughs> so, it's, a, it's a, a situation in which university divestment, each new one we, we greet with a lot of joy and a lot of celebration, but it's no longer a surprise. And I think that's, that's a real indication of um, the stage we've reached. Um, so at UCL we haven't yet reached that, that stage, but um, what's really exciting is that we seem to basically have won the argument. Um, when we talk to students, um, it takes about five seconds for them to realize that this is actually the right thing to do. Um, we don't have to make that argument with staff. Again, um, we held an academic debate um, in March and like 97% of people attending um, thought that divestment was the right option. Even with management, 
when we're trying to negotiate these things. They don't come back with arguments against divestment. They never do that. Their tactic is always to divert, um, to try and bring on to some other issue or to offer some, some other solution um, that's usually greenwashed. But they realize that they've got no leg to stand on and the argument is really won. So it becomes how to just pin them down, how to secure that win, uh, which is the task. Um, so maybe what I'd like to do is just focus a bit on the value of, go back to the occupation and explain why I think that that occupation and taking direct action, um, particularly in the university context, is important and what it can do. Um, so I guess the first thing is just, um, as a tactic, it puts direct pressure on the university. Um, we occupied a privatised space, a marquee that has been put up in, university, um, in UCL's main quad, which is managed by a private company, Sodexo, and which charges um, hundreds of pounds to student societies to use it. Um, so we, by occupying that space, we're depriving them of money. Um, we're being an incredibly visible um, reminder to university management that this is an issue that they've got to deal with. Um, so as a tactic, it really forces their hand when in the past they've been happy to just say, oh yeah, we set up a committee and um, they're currently reviewing things and um, it allows them kind of get, to get off the hook. Um, but second, more broadly, I think the direct action has, it's been amazing just to see the amount of energy um, in the student body and the staff body that that has generated in just a week. We started planning last week and there was just a few of us, the campaign was kind of not at a lull, but maybe lacking a bit of energy. But just in a week, we had 40 people come, 30, 40 people come occupy on the first night of the take. Um, and since then, we've had people coming in and out. And it's just a really exciting time to galvanize um, momentum, not just for this campaign, but kind of for the future. These are the activists that are going to be going out into the world and, um, and doing more stuff. Like, from a personal experience, I can say that like, my climate activism journey started probably like a year ago today even, or a year ago, like last week, when I signed a petition at UCL, and since then I've been involved in this campaign, I've helped shut down um, coal mines in the north of England, it's just been a whirlwind, and that, that wouldn't have started without kind of university students, direct action at university, radicalising students. Um, and thirdly, and then I'll shut up, um, <laughs> opening, a, opening a space for discussion, um, that direct action, that taking of the space, um, in a similar way to this kind of the the Zach here provides a space for people to kind of um, step back and consider. Um, it provides a space for people who maybe <coughs> don't know about divestment or who maybe have a grievance against the university or have vague feelings but don't know how to channel them to come in there and really direct that energy. Um, and also to have some of the more difficult um, conversations. We invited radical groups from um, London Campaign to London Latin, it's a radical South collective of South American activists, um, part of the Wretched of the Earth block and the London March, um, who make you kind of join the dots between colonialism, imperialism and climate change and how that reflects on the climate movement itself and how we can, how the climate movement itself needs to look itself um, in the mirror and overcome some of those issues to really become the really broad, powerful movement that it, it needs to be to accelerate some of these. <laughs> so I'll stop there uh, for the moment. But I have more questions. <laughs> so what is your family saying? Don't I think this is a little bit too radical, like occupying a university? I mean, they don't follow Twitter, so it, it may well be that they don't know. Um, but I think, yeah, I'm really grateful to the divestment movement for kind of overcoming my, my parents' conservative background. Um, <laughs> um, but I, I could do a shout out to my brother who's just, I don't know if he's in here, but he's just launched a, an amazing divestment campaign at Cambridge University. And it's, <laughs> just doing amazing stuff. They, he was telling me an anecdote about how he was on a call with um, People and Planet, um, a coordinator, divestment coordinator there, um, with a group of them doing a kind of planning a direct action. And then only halfway through was it that the coordinator realized that this was just one subgroup of their campaign. In fact, they were, they've got 40, 50 people and they've only just started. 
impressive. So, and when you look into the future, into the next months, what comes after the occupation? Um, well, um, we've got a meeting actually with the head of finance on Tuesday, which I need to actually, someone needs to go to that. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, I have a feeling that what they're going to offer us from our lovely friends at Sheffield have, have given us a little hint. It's going to be greenwashing, it's going to be a sustainability fund focused on engagement. I read the document and it was even kind of not being certain about kind of the effect of gas on, on climate. It was saying, well, it depends on the methane emissions and the kind of process. So I'm not that hopeful for that, but we've got we've got talks there. So promise. Good stuff. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so Mia here from Germany, <coughs> Münster, northwestern part. <coughs> yeah, you've got some great successes lately. <laughs> Actually, yes. <laughs> what did happen? Tell me all about it. After two and a half years of campaigning, campaigning the city finally divested. <laughs> and this was not only uh, just a divestment success, but it was the first success we had in Germany. So that was really empowering and uh, motivating and giving momentum to the whole campaign in Germany. Wow, so... So now that you have this first win, what, what's changing? What has changed? Well, uh, first of all, I personally, I felt, well, yeah, we achieved it now. What now? What next? <laughs> what to do? But there are... Uh, Definitely other things to do at the university, for example, uh, which is not that much cooperative with us. Um, yeah, and uh, there's another campaign we, stayed, uh, we started with the LWL. It's a, I don't know the word in English actually, Landschaftsverband. Yeah, it's an a institution. government institution or? Government, yeah. Uh, I don't think so, no. Okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> doesn't matter. <laughs> but I have heard they have huge shares in RWE. Okay, and yeah. what's that? Sorry? What is RWE? I don't think everyone knows. No, yeah, we know that. Um, it's a company, an, an energy company, um, mostly, uh, well, um, the most, or the uh, a lot of um, the energy energy they produce comes from oil, and uh, they are located in the Rhineland area, where the Energiewende action uh, took place this year. Huh? Oil or coal? Did I say oil? Yeah, you said oil. I wanted to say coal. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and they are evil. They just evil. They like Shell, and they, yeah, they part of uh, the two hundred companies, um, the, the most um, biggest companies uh, we have to divest, divest from. Okay. And this in institution, the LWL, uh, is investing about uh, nineteen million euros in RWE. And what is this institution about? Like, what are they doing? The LWL? They're um, a kind of a social I don't know, association. They... Um, oh, this is really hard to explain in English, but... <laughs> they organize, like, uh, what we call an ecological year. Um, which is for young people to um, discover um, or, or try out um, uh, some, I don't know what, yeah. They, they, it's like a practice, but it's one year, and they uh, can try this out, and it has an ecological background, for example, and um, yeah, it does really fit 
with the <laughs> with the the yeah their um, money issues. Yeah. And how will you um, campaign them? Are there any plans right now for this institution to divest? Um, we're working together with Greenpeace on this. Um, Greenpeace Germany uh, has decided to um, um, cooperate with us and uh, make a campaign, a kickoff, a campaign, a divestment campaign. Um, and locally, we're going in Münster. We're going to uh, work together too. And um, well, yeah, we we've sent them a letter already, so um, they should have been starting thinking about divesting. <laughs> um, yeah, and we will see what what comes out of that. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the next already started. Good work. And so we also wanted to have um, campaigners from Sweden over. They couldn't come, but Olivia is here. She's also a divestment campaigner, but uh, in Sweden, but also my colleague. <laughs> so Olivia, um, how did you get with divestment in the mainstream? I think nobody knew about the tactic before, and now I think everyone's talking about it and wants to join. Sure, you can, you can consider this a story that you listen to while you tweet us your questions or thoughts to uh, hashtag divestcop. Questions and ideas to share with all of these brilliant uh, people. Uh, hashtag divestcop. Uh, so, in Sweden we started the campaign two and a half years ago now, and to start off with, like, there's, divest didn't exist as a word in Sweden. Uh, there was one kind of a word that was very, like, used in the financial business, which was of Utra, and it sounds really, really boring. We couldn't imagine putting that, like, on banners, because it sounded too, yeah, like, something for business financial analysts. Um, so we were, like, thinking, okay, should we just use the English words? Like, we call ourselves fossil-free, because one of the strengths of this movement is that like, we're, we're working locally and nationally, but we're part of this huge global movement and we connect by our name, Fossil Free, uh, but also through this word, divest, but we decided we'll just create our new word. Uh, so we made up this word, uh, divestia, which is divest, but made into a word in Swedish. Uh, and I mean, like just this Wednesday, I met a journalist from National Radio by the Bouger at the conference, and she did a live interview with me and the big pension fund in Sweden, and their main question was, so, divestering, <laughs> what is that all about? Um, and, and this word has really, like, it's been proposed to be one of the new words for, from this year for the big dictionary in Sweden. <laughs> Uh, and I think that's just like this brilliant sign of how how all these campaigners in the dozen of campaigns that we have locally, both in cities and universities in Sweden, how that's really made it into the mainstream. So I'm really I'm really glad we had the uh, the boldness to just make up our own word and go for it and put that on all our banners because yeah, it made sense and it's made a difference. This, can I ask people a real favor? This just occurred to me. But maybe we could do it as we're starting to ask questions. If maybe we could go down and sit down front just here for a minute and someone could take a picture. Our friends at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, today went past, this is day 50 that they've been sitting in in the hallway outside the president's office. These are a bunch of scientists, 40 or 50. I think it may be the longest divestment sit in almost if there's ever been. 
they're amazing people, and I know that they love it. If we could do a picture where people maybe could just hold up a five and a zero or something with their hands, and that's something like that, and just let them know that we're thinking, oh yeah, five and a fist, that's good. And, uh, and let them know we're thinking of, that'd be a great picture, I think, to send back if people don't know. So, who could take the picture? You can do it? Awesome. many many more so you you can see the divestment movement is growing and we are really really strong and begin to stigmatize the industry that is wrecking the planet and those that are profiting from the package and um, I hope you will all join us in this movement for me to me it became a big big family um, we also do direct action together in, in Europe and we meet regularly and it's, the bonds are becoming really, really strong. I trust everyone in this movement. That's a very beautiful thing. And so I want to thank you all again. And